A very good morning to all the participants and our distinguished speaker. I am Amit Kumbhar, and on behalf of CEPs here in SIT Bombay, I take this opportunity to welcome you all for today's talk on atom probe tomography. Title: Introduction to Atom Probe Tomography (APT). Fundamentals: Technology, Specimen Preparation, and Example Application Examples. This talk will be presented by Dr. Peter Clifton. Before we proceed, I would request the head of uh, CEPs here in this Professor Suparna Mukherjee to give us an overview of CEPs IIT Bombay. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Amit. I welcome all the participants for this webinar. And I would like to share a brief presentation and give an introduction to Saif. I'll be sharing uh, the presentation. So I will uh, briefly introduce uh, Saif, that is Sophisticated Analytical Instrumentation Facility and the Center for Research in Nanotechnology and Science at IIT Bombay. So Saif has been existing since 1976, um, and CRNTS started somewhere around 2005. And the two were merged in 2008. And in this facility, we have PhD students under CRNTS. And uh, in the whole of SAIF and CRNTS, we have numerous sophisticated instruments, uh, including various facilities in SAIF, uh, which are funded by DST and several instruments under uh, CRNTS also. So we have. Uh, more than 1700 users uh, where they used our facilities last year and we received more than 13,000 samples during the year. So these are reflecting some of the facilities at SAIF. We have electron microscopy facilities, FECTEM, FEGSEM, dual beam, uh, that is FIB, FEGSEM. We also have various chromatography coupled with mass spectrometry facilities, uh, HRGCMS, HRLCMS, orbit trap, and QTOF and the inductively coupled plasma MS um, and also the time of flight MS. And um, in addition, we have various miscellaneous instruments like CHNSO, ESR, FTIR, NMR, and uh, small angle X-ray scattering. And also recently we have added various thermal analysis instruments. Uh, the last one that is uh, DMA is still to be installed, but it has already arrived. Now, uh, some of the instruments we have under CRNTS is ICPAES, uh, laser Raman uh, spectrometer, and we have the electrons, uh, environmental scanning electron microscope, uh, the fake TEM 200 kV, and also a 2DGC and UVV spectrophotometer. Now, today's talk is on another facility, which is actually um, the National Facility for Atom Probe Tomography, which is um, something our users can use, that is internal users, but this is a facility located in um, IIT Madras, but our users have access to that facility, and that is what we will be focusing our webinar today on. So we receive samples from all over India, as shown here. These are the Saif CRNTS staff members who uh, help in maintaining the instruments, uh, performing the analysis, etc. We routinely get visitors um, visiting our center, and we also host diverse webinars. And we have a YouTube channel for SAIF. You may want to look that up. We also are on LinkedIn. And uh, today, the talk is on the NF-APT facility, which was set up uh, jointly in uh, collab various IITs and other academic institutes collabor and research institutes collaborated to have this facility set up in IIT Madras. And IIT Bombay is one of the partners involved uh, since the very beginning when the facility was set up. And IIT Bombay students and faculty members can avail the facility. However, in this facility, we do not directly accept external samples, although they, uh, they can be submitted in IIT Madras directly. So we have the data analysis feature, uh, features and all that here. Now, uh, today's talk will be on introduction to atom probe tomography, fundamentals, technology, specimen preparation, and examples. And I'm sure this would be very informative for all of us. With that, I would like to hand over, and without delay, we can get started with the webinar. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for presenting uh, information about uh, 
uh, all the current facility at set i would like to introduce our today's speaker dr peter clifton peter clifton has fulfilled a variety of technical and commercial roles it, uh, is currently working a global sales le leader for apt at chemica he has been working with atom probe techniques for nearly 20 years including time as a research assistant within the oxford material department atom probe group working with professor alfred uh, serezo and Sh george Mayer, uh, smith and as well as multiple engineering and scientific roles with the sigate technology ons imago and chemica peter read physics at university of birmingham uk and gained his doctorate degree studying the interfaces between diamond and metal thin film thin films using variety of surface science methods he has presented innovative talks and papers at wide variety of international conferences, seminars, and workshops, and has published more than 50 APT-related uh, APT papers. We are sure that this talk will be enlighten the knowledge of researchers to use for APT their uh, research purpose. Just an important note, queries related to today's talk should be posted in a question and answer box only. We will be posting the feedback, feedback form shortly. Kindly fill it. So let us commence today's talk, code user. Thank you very much for the kind introduction uh, and also the, the fascinating uh, review of your facilities. So yes, I'm going to talk today about APT and I'm going to focus on um, uh, a, a little bit of what the instrument does, what the method provides, uh, and then get into details of how to make specimens and some capabilities of the atom probe itself and give an example or a range of examples of the type of things that uh, the atom probe can be used to measure. So hopefully I want to inspire you or interest you anyway. Inspiration is difficult to achieve, but I would like to get you uh, at least more aware of the atom probe capability and uh, maybe it will be useful uh, for your research. So, um, so yes. So the first thing we should we should think about. There was an interesting slide of all of the techniques that are available to you as users of the of the facilities uh, in Mumbai. Uh, and so, if you want to understand the microstructure of your materials, if you want to use microscopy, you're really trying to understand what the structure of your materials are. And if, if you need to do that at the nanoscale, you would use microscopy and, of course, electron microscopy. So if you use SEM or TEM, you get a variety of contrast. So I'm showing a couple of as an introductory slide here with a very old uh, examples of um, what you can see if you look at an example of an iron-based superalloy. So you get this interesting two-phase microstructure from uh, for the contrast from the uh, electron microscope, TM in this case. And if you zoom in, um, you can see at higher magnifications and high resolution. And, you know, it's possible to see um, that in addition to the coarse microstructure, there's some fine scale uh, microstructure present, which you can see from this. Um, oh, so I need to share my screen. Apparently. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. I apologize for that. I thought uh, I had already been shared. Okay. Can everyone see now? Yes. Yes, we can see. <laughs> yes, my, apolo my apologies. That was an interesting experiment in how long it would take people to uh, say they couldn't see anything. Okay. So yes, I'm going to introduce APT, talk about some of the um, capabilities uh, of the instrument and the technique, and then talk about specimen preparation and how to do atom probe experiments and how it might help your research. So um, as I said, if we take an example material and we look at the microstructure in the electron microscope, it could be SEM or TEM, we get contrast. And this allows us to see uh, the microstructure. And if we go to high uh, magnification, so we have a 100 nanometer scale bar here, we can see bright and dark contrast between the matrix and the coarse phases here. But we can also see speckling. So this 
high, and I hope you can see there's some fine scale. It tells us there's some fine scale structure present in this material. And if we zoom in, um, uh, we can see dark, which is the nickel based material in this case. And we've got these bright, uh, what we think are small features, maybe precipitates, uh, and they have the same contrast as the as the iron chrome secondary phase in this case. And so I think we're all familiar with how the electron microscopes give us contrast, at least to it, in a simple way. Um, but the atom probe gives us the ability to understand these materials in a completely different way. So what the atom probe does, it we take a piece of your material and we remove atoms one at a time, and we're able to identify the atom and measure their position in three dimensions with near atomic resolution. So an atom probe data set is a point cloud of, of atoms, which we can, by, by giving a color to the different ele elemental identity, we can kind of map visually what the concentration is. So here I'm showing an analysis from the same material as illustrated in the TM data, but uh, illustrate, I'm showing in the atom probe data that the iron atoms are shown as orange. So we can see the bright orange areas correspond, it looks like, to this iron chrome phase. Uh, and, and so we can, you know, uh, we can identify the phase boundaries just by looking at the local changes in, con in concentration. And so if we just show the isoconcentration surfaces pulling out the changes in iron, this means we can kind of describe the microstructure. And because we have very good spatial resolution, similar, similar to electron microscopy, you know, we can pull out the very fine scale features, which are in fact these precipitates or these very, you know, nanometer sized precipitates. So the atom probe gives you different contrast from measuring the local concentration uh, by atom counting, and it is highly complementary to the other methods that, uh, for example, electron microscopy. The, cool, the, the really nice thing about atom probe is that it is, um, it is three-dimensional, so it's a tomographical technique. So when you measure where, the precip where a precipitate is, so for example, one of these here, it, it, you get the information of where it is in relation to all the other microstructural features. So it gives you a very rich description of the microstructure that's present in your materials. So another example, not a metallurgical one, but a semiconductor one where magnesium atoms, which are dopants in gallium nitride, are displayed in a Saturn probe data set. Um, and this allows us to image where the dopant species are and actually see visually that at the top of this p-dope layer, we have less magnesium atoms than we probably do at the bottom. And maybe we have some you know, non-randomness here. We've got some clustering. So in an atom probe data set, you know, we have a 3D volume that we're analyzing. We have something tens of millions of atoms, depending on you know, the nature of the details of the analysis. And what's really important is we have high detection efficiency. So we're counting the individual atoms. We count most of them. And that allows us to get very good uh, compositional measurements from very small volumes of material. And let's remember that in a cubic nanometer of gallium nitride, you maybe have 90 atoms. So we're able to detect the majority of them. In, in our analysis. Okay, so a very brief introduction to how the technique works. Um, we have to have a specimen, uh, and in order to make the, or have the ability to remove the atoms, uh, we have to have a, a high field. So this means we have to have a needle-shaped specimen. Uh, here is a kind of an image of an atom probe specimen looks like. That means that um, if we apply a modest voltage on the specimen relative to the detector, if we have a very sharp specimen, we have a concentration of field at the apex, and that allows us to achieve the types of fields we need to remove uh, the, the atoms, which is very high. It's like tens of volts per nanometer. Okay, so what we have, 
a position sensitive detector which can de detect when the ions arrive we encode their arrival position and because we evaporate ions one at a time uh, we also know the order of arrival and so then we use a relatively simple we detect millions of atoms and then we reconstruct the data into a 3d point cloud in effect of the analyzed volume and it's that that we do the measurements on okay so the atom probe uh, it uses a dc field a pulsing technique to allow us to get time of flight measurements so that allows us to measure the time it takes for individual ions to leave the specimen arrive at the detector we then get a, a mass uh, spectrum which is time of flight we can allocate master charge to each peak and, there, and therefore identify the ions. And it's this combination of the elemental identity and the individual position of each ions uh, integrated into this volume, which allows us to achieve uh, the, the measurement capabilities. It's done at UHV, it's important to understand. And, you know, we, um, we keep the specimen cold during the experiment. We need to preserve spatial resolution. We need to suppress, uh, you know, migration, and we want to, you know, really minimize the thermal energy of the departing iron species. Okay, so how does it work? Well, our specimen uh, is shaped into the form of a needle. It has a very sharp tip, so a very small radius of the order of tens or hundreds of nanometers. We'll talk about that more in specimen preparation terms. But um, really, the, sim the way that it, wo it works, it's a, it's a point projection method. So when the ions leave the surface, they hit our detector. And because our detector is six orders of magnitude bigger than our specimen, uh, we are able to, when an ion arrives at the detector, we are able to measure the arrival position carefully enough that we can infer, using a, a simple uh, reconstruction algorithm, the departure position of the iron. So this allows us, this is what fundamentally allows the technique to work. Um, okay, so it's a destructive technique. We measure a mass spectrum from all of the ions that are arrived. Uh, collectively, this gives us the composition of the analyzed volume. And in our mass spectrum, we have lots of peaks and we can identify them. So, for example, uh, you know, these two peaks here at five and five and a half Daltons are from isotopes of boron. When we range the peak, we essentially count the number of ions underneath that peak. And so when we have counted the boron, that boron, uh, counts. We can we go through the whole mass spectrum and uh, add everything up, and that gives us the bulk composition. And then when we impose three dimensionality on the on the data set, this gives us the ability to measure local uh, compositions. And I'll show a number of examples. So what's really good about Atom Probe is we detect individual atoms. We count them individually. So if you're really wanting to measure uh, you know, feature sizes from sub nanometer to hundreds of nanometers with really good compositional accuracy. Atom probe is the best choice. Um, so, you know, this this plot illustrates here that it overlaps with other methods. So, on the x-axis we have you know the lateral resolution that's possible, and on the y-axis we have detection sensitivity. Uh, and so, Atom probe is you know, really, really performs very well at, as I've said, sub nanometer to hundreds of nanometers uh, dimension. So in the meso scale, if your materials are affected by their composition, you know, in the hundred nanometers uh, range or regime and below, then Atom Probe could be really useful for your technique. And this is, it, as I'll show, it. You know, this can be structural materials or functional materials, devices, thin films, uh, any, you know, of a wide variety of materials. So an important thing to stress, um, time of flight means we detect all elements with equal sensitivity. That's very important. Uh, and, of course, we get good spatial resolution because of the technique. Uh, this Another thing that this plot shows is that 
uh, you know, the facilities that were described earlier in your lab, which you would routinely use, so SEM and maybe TEM, you know, these give you very important information uh, at high spatial resolution, but the atom probe can be correlative with those. You can combine the atom probe data with those types of techniques if you want a more complete understanding of your materials. Okay, so as I've said, in this technique, a bit like TM, you know, you need to make a specimen. You can't start with a, you know, a huge bulk piece of material and use atom probe or TM. So you have to uh, be aware that your field of view is limited by the technique, uh, and you have to be able to make a specimen to uh, that you know allows your experiment to be successful. So. <clears throat> Here we have um, an example, really, uh, from someone who created these slides originally, who is, has a history of EBSD, for example. Um, and if you make a specimen, you have to be aware of, uh, you have to want to spend the right amount of time and not waste time. So here, if you want to do EBSD on a sample, you know, if you don't prepare your sample, if you don't prepare this, uh, if you don't polish to get good surface finish, your data quality will be bad. and You may not learn anything at all. But as you progress through polishing time, you know, you will get excellent contrast. And then at some point, you'll get to the, you know, law of diminishing returns. And you can keep going for way too long, 10 times too long, and you'll get no benefit. So, you know, we want to make specimens that are good enough, but, but also uh, we want to use our time efficiently. And there's a number of factors to take into account when we make specimens. Of course, we want to make sure that the thing that we want to analyze is in our specimen. Um, that's important. We don't want to contaminate or uh, in, damage our material so that what we measure is um, not valid or we don't really understand how reliable our measurement is. And so we want to, there's a number of factors that we have to consider. Uh, and so for an atom probe specimen, if you want to make a bulk analysis of your material, you're not, you don't care about specifically choosing um, a specific feature. Maybe you want to just randomly measure what the composition is in the matrix. You know, making an atom probe specimen is relatively simple. We just have to create a specimen with the right shape. So it has to be, uh, you know, have a tip radius of less than 100 nanometers. That sounds very esoteric, but you can do that in some quite simple ways. Some important considerations with Atom Probe, um, like TM, you have to have robust samples. If you make a sample that disintegrates when you handle it, you know, you cannot successfully complete your experiment. So in Atom Probe, we have to put a we have to put stress on the sample to remove atoms one at a time. And so we need to be working with relatively strong materials. If you have large voids or interfaces that are extremely weak, then that is uh, a challenge that you have to use special methods to overcome. You're really talking in default here about, you know, analyzing bulk materials. So um, basically, if you, you want your region of interest, if it's a specific thing like a grain boundary, to be close to the apex of the specimen within 100 nanometers or something, uh, because you don't want to be wasting time going through material you don't care about uh, uh, before you get your key measurement. Okay, And of course, the specimen you make has to fit into the instrument. In Atom Probe, we have needle-shaped samples, like wires here, which can be electropolished, or we have a variety of other holders that we can use to support specimens, which I'll talk about in more detail. Okay, so what is a key thing to worry about, to be aware of in Atom Probe? So during an experiment, um, we want to maintain the field to be the right level as we start our experiment, and then all the way through the data acquisition. So the instrument itself, can vary the voltage that it applies. And so you want to start with a relatively sharp specimen and make sure that your shank angle here, if your tip will basically means that as you remove material, 
it will become slightly more blunt and the instrument can cope with that by increasing the specimen voltage. But it has a finite range of voltage. So for example, as this, uh, it, as this sample here has been analyzed, we've started at you know, 2000 volts and the instrument, once we started the acquisition, has increased the voltage as it removes material and the specimen uh, starts to become a little bit blunt, more blunt. So here we start, our specimen's very sharp, and then at the end of the experiment, for example, if we look here, you know, we've removed 100 nanometers or something. Our tip has become a little bit higher tip radius. So in order to maintain the same field, the instruments just increase the voltage. That's fine. We just have to make sure that the final radius is sufficiently small that uh, you can conduct this experiment successfully. And, you know, we can it's easy to understand that, but you know, a rule of thumb is that you know you need to start off less than 100 nanometers and finish at you know 200 nanometers or something like that. Okay, and this is the analyzed volume that you will achieve in your in your atom probe data reconstruction. Okay, so what's the best geometry? Well, if you have constant shank angle here. You know, this is what a tip could look like, uh, but you don't want it to be too sharp and too too long and thin because it becomes a little bit fragile. Here's what a standard specimen can look like, just schematically. And if you want to do um, a kind of ideal shape where you're you are thin at the top but thicker at the bottom, so it's stronger, that's perfect. And in the in the standard methods, you can kind of create these. Um, shapes naturally and relatively easily. So in our technology, we've developed micro tips to mount and host specimens, and they have these sorts of geometries. Uh, okay, so, um, you know, traditionally you can make um, needles very easily by electropolishing. So you have uh, your material, traditionally a, a metal. You cut a small piece, we call it a matchstick because it's basically long and a bit thin, but cylindrical in, uh, or it's rectangular, sorry, in profile. And then you have um, the an electropolishing system which has a suitable, some chemicals, and you dip your, your specimen in, move it up and down, and you apply a voltage which en enables the etching and basically you can create needles. This is very simple and works surprisingly well. Uh, and people around the world still use this quite a lot. It has the advantage of not requiring fib access, and so in many cases it's kind of efficient to do that. The, down, the, the limitation of this method is it's good at randomly um, sampling, creating specimens, to look at bulk materials, but if you want to look at a specific feature, for example, a grain boundary or some other thing, you, you don't really have control over that. So uh, a more general method is to use the dual beam fib. So this is an SEM, which allows you, it has an electron column, so you can see very clearly what you're doing, and then um, um, uh, an iron beam, uh, which allows you to make changes in the material. Uh, and so you can image uh, and basically mill features. And this is cl classically used for the last 25, 30 years for specimen preparation. Uh, and so, you know, you make some marks. You, this is, the, this is the, the surface that you're going to extract your specimen from. Um, and the good thing with the, the focus ion beam is it's a general method. If you can get it into the, if you can get your piece of material into the instrument, you can make specimens out of it uh, in a very flexible, well-controlled way. Okay, so um, this, the way to make atom probe specimens is very similar to making electron microscope EM lamella. Uh, and so, but I can quickly go through it. So if routinely we have a surface, a piece of material we want to extract uh, our specimens from this. And so the first thing we're going to do is remove a chunk of material. 
So this is a simple mark that's delineating that we're going to remove some material from between these plus and minus. The first stage we do is we can deposit some uh, metal. Uh, and this is just a protective cap uh, to protect the, the piece of material underneath this deposition from damage. Um, and so then we come in and we dig some holes, we excavate holes so that, you know, now what we've got is this one membrane of material uh, which is left, and at the bottom, when we, if we could see, it's uh, there's basically it's not fixed at the bottom. We've milled in at an angle, normally 20 degrees, so that this is a kind of a wedge free at the bottom. So then we cut it off at one end. We bring in our micro manipulator needle, attach it, um, and then basically. The only thing that's holding this piece of material onto the, the original substrate is this piece here. And so if you do a quick cut in the fib, then basically you can lift, you can lift out this needle and remove the piece of material. Okay, so that's what's done. And then you can take your needle and mount it. You can mount this other piece of material somewhere else. And in this case, we're showing an atom probe coupon which has microtips on it, which is an ideal support. So here um, we've taken one slice of the lift out, mounted it onto the, the suitable support, and that's what we're going to make our specimen out of. So here we have a side view of that same thing. We've deposited platinum on here to stick it down securely. Uh, and now we're going to use an annular milling approach, approach to just form the needle. OK, so an annular mill means we have two uh, radius measurements and basically you only mill between the inner and the outer. So in this middle period, middle in this middle area, there's no milling from the top. OK, so this allows us to form needle shapes and by using a couple of different inner and outer radius combinations, different milling conditions, which is all uh, described in the literature. We have tech notes to that describe this, you can form the um, the shape of your specimen. And importantly, um, you know, this milling process is quite fast in traditional uh, FIBSEMs. It uses high energy gallium. Uh, and so there is some implantation and damage that you incur when you use that 30 kV gallium. So in order to make sure that there's not too much damage in your specimen, the final step is done at a lower kinetic energy, beam kinetic energy. So we've did, the final step has been developed to use the lower energy, basically top-down mill, which is quite effective in just eliminating the material that's been exposed to the high energy gallium and, and may have uh, damage. And anyway, in Atom Probe, we can see the gallium implantation quite nicely. So that, that is what's led to this development. Okay, so that's how we make our specimens. Making bulk specimens, I mean, you have to use the instrument, but fundamentally, it's relatively, it's quite straightforward. And it probably takes 40 minute, minutes per specimen for a batch of, you know, five specimens or something. Okay, so um, another thing to can, can be aware of, if we want to specifically uh, include a certain feature in our specimen, uh, we need to obviously do something slightly different. So here, for example, we have a coarse grained uh, metal. And, you know, in this case, years ago, people wanted to know what was present at this grain boundary. So we get contrast in the SEM. That makes it quite simple for us to, as part of our SEM imaging, we see where the grain boundary is. And so we decide, OK, I'm going to make my lift out that has the grain boundary along the long axis. I can take a little cut here, check what the grain boundary angle is that I'm going to include in my specimen. And then I can make a lift out which has a, the grain boundary of this known specific two grains uh, all the way along my lift out. So that means that then I can make specimens which have this grain boundary located within them somehow. Okay, uh, so this is a, something you could do, and I'm going to 
So this is an, uh, one example. I'm going to show you, though, a quite advanced or a kind of a more uh, complex case where we have, for example, a device structure such as you would have in the semiconductor industry. OK, so this type of device structure could be three dimensional and quite complicated. Uh, and maybe, I mean, this is if you were doing this type of research, you might want to look at the gate or the fin or the substrate or any number of uh, you might you know, specific areas you might want to be analyzed. The point is that the flexibility exists to make these specimens. You, depending on what you're trying to measure and the nature of the size and uh, the geometry of the thing that you're wanting to test, you can you have flexibility as how to make samples. So if we think about this structure in a kind of three-dimensional way where we have we're imaging in this direction here so we have fins in this long axis and then a gate going across in this way you know we can make specimens by creating specimen by creating our uh, tips like this so it's kind of a top-down analysis so we're creating a specimen uh, to include for example one of these fins or it's possible for us to rotate the material upside down and do backside analysis, or we could do cross-section analysis, uh, or even cross-section in the uh, in the other orientation. So, if you're making a TM sample or an atom probe sample, you know you have the capability to do this in the uh, in the in the FIB. It's very powerful, and you know this allows you to design your experiments accordingly. This is quite advanced type of specimen prep, I'm just illustrating that it's possible and is being done, you know, routinely on a, you know, daily basis in many companies and in lots of universities. Okay, and, you know, why you would want to orient your specimen like this really depends what you're trying to measure, whether you want to get, you know, a lot of the fin or you want to get the top upper surface or it really comes down to what it is you're trying to measure where the dopants are the details of your experiment okay but you can design and make specimens in a in a you know in a in a there's a lot of flexibility in how you do this okay um of course um it's also important sometimes or for some experiments to use correlative microscopy so you want you might routinely measure your materials in the electron microscope or tm and you want to directly compare the the atom probe data uh, and of course so this is also routinely possible so let's be clear complementary microscopy is you know you're imaging something in one technique and then you take a similar piece of material and you can compare the results uh, measured in a different technique on a different piece of material, but we think it's similar. Correlative, directly correlative microscopy is where you're using this multiple measurements on the same volume of material so that you can directly map them together. So here's a nice example uh, of uh, grain boundary studies in, in um, a metallurgy case. So you can characterize your material structurally in the stem you can identify what the types of grain boundaries are, uh, but then you can take that that, apps, that exact specimen and analyze it in the atom probe, and you can measure what the segregation is at each of those grain boundaries. Right, so you can precisely measure the light element distribution of the grain boundaries, something you can't do uh, in stem or electron microscopy, and then you can combine those data together and gain new learning. So, you know, that's the power of correlative microscopy. And, you know, that's something that uh, is routinely possible to do. Okay, so uh, as I've said, uh, if you have nice contrast it's in the SEM or even EBSD, um, that's great. You can go in and pick out a piece of material. And when you have a large volume, you can still get good contrast. But as you reduce the volume of your material, your traditional contrast, it becomes degraded, and you may have to sort of use some guesswork to position the grain boundary at the apex of your specimen. You can do that, but you're not directly imaging it. And also, you may not have a direct 
clear, unambiguous measurement of what type of grain boundary you are working with. But what you can do is use transmission mode EBSD or Kikuchi diffraction, transmission mode Kikuchi diffraction. And so if you have a detector in your FibSem that you're making out of probe specimens, you can incorporate this analysis efficiently, really, as part of your specimen preparation. And so you can make atom probe specimens that you've extracted from bulk materials and you've directly measured using transmission mode EBSD what type of grain boundary is present and where it is in the tip apex. Very powerful, uh, being used very widely uh, for atom probe uh, specimen preparation. It's fantastic. Um, another thing you can do if you have the capability is to do STEM mode in your FIB if you have it. Again, this is a really nice capability. It's another feather to your bow if you want to make specimens, and it's useful really to, for device studies and thin film structures. Um, it's maybe easier than going to the TM to do your analysis. Okay, um, so that's a lot of words about specimen preparation. I hope I haven't intimidated you about how difficult it is. I was trying really to sh to give you an idea of how flexible and powerful the methods are that are available. Um, so if we think, I, if we move away from bulk materials, whether they be, you know, bits of wafers or, or metals or, you know, metal or thin film structures on wafers, if we think about powders or particles, this is a lithium battery example. So this sample, the cathode material, is basically present as a powder. So the size of the particles are of the order of, you know, 10 microns or below. So in Atom Probe, because our samples are small, we can treat these like bulk materials. So specimen preparation is not that difficult. We can just basically go in and treat one of these particles as a as a bulk material. Okay. So here's a we take a cross section of one particle. We get all of this contrast. It's fascinating. We can go in with the atom probe and, you know, look at the surface or in the middle. You know, we have the capability to do this um, in the with the fit. Okay, so we choose a particle, we make a lift out, pretty standard specimen preparation, and you know, then we can do we can do our analysis of our in this case lithium battery material, but it doesn't matter. It's just the powder, right? If the powder is very small, like smaller than the apex of an atom probe specimen, then it gets a little bit more involved. You know, if you really have nanometer sized powders, then the way to do this is to distribute your powder on a suitable flat surface and then sputter or grow an overlayer on top of that. Uh, and then you can make a specimen out of this nominally bulk material. Um, so if you're really looking, this is more involved, but if you want to look at powders that really are nanometer sized, uh, people are doing this. Um, okay, so moving on to give you an idea, instead of thinking about applications, uh, I'm really going to focus on what type of things are is Atombro good at measuring. We've already discussed, or I've introduced the idea that you know, our, our analysis volumes are relatively small, you know, um, compared to historical atom probe data sets, our, you know, our data set sizes are massive, but we're still measuring hundreds of nanometers and down. So, um, you know, it's still relatively small when you, uh, when you think about uh, feature sizes generally. Um, so what atom probe is really good at though, is primarily, Looking at buried interfaces, I think it's the it's it's pretty much the best technique. Looking at buried interfaces, if you want to understand the morphology, the intermixing, and segregation that's present at an interface, the atom probe is uniquely capable at doing that. Uh, the same is true for grain boundaries. I mean, we can think of those as interfaces, right? They're just more complicated. Uh, they're less general type of interface. Uh, because we're able to detect um, the presence of individual atoms 
distributed in the matrix. We can also look at clustering effects. Um, and that goes also, of course, phase uh, growth and, you know, precipitate formation and growth. Um, also diffusion implant profiles, dilute space species, trace elements, and uh, compositional changes at defects. And these are all classic things that atom probe is really good at doing. And of course, an atom probe study um, really will will hopefully see you know one or more of these features in in a specimen. So if we go through these uh, in general, um, of course, what's happening at an interface? It can be diffuse. So you have graded interfaces, intermixing present. You can have morphology, um, or you can have compositional changes at the interface with segregation or the presence of uh, additional uh, species. Atombrobe is really good at separating uh, morphology or topography from um, interdiffuseness because essentially we measure the interface by looking at its uh, highly spatially resolved uh, uh, local changing concentration. So if if there's a if the interface has a high roughness, we can separate that from you know the interdiffuseness that's present at the interface. So I show a couple of examples here. We're showing interfaces from you know in engineered materials here. A couple of these so you know, semiconductor devices where things have been deposited or an LED structure where we have quantum wells. And, you know, we can measure, uh, look for subtle differences in roughness or interdiffuseness at the top and bottom of these interfaces. But grain boundaries, we've already covered this a little bit, but I mean, you know, grain boundaries are critically important in many uh, polycrystalline materials. And so I show one recent paper here uh, in Acta Materiala, and it is one structural material, a metal, and it just shows atom probe randomly selected from different parts of the microstructure, and these are all to scale. But basically, uh, this is a carbon-rich material where carbon is segregating at the grain boundaries, and we can see that as, as we sample different parts of this microstructure, the the grain size and grain boundary segregation can be precisely mapped by using the atom probe. So here we have large grains, uh, we've got some clusters, and in these other regions, atom probe region two, you know, we've got smaller grains and significant carbon enrichment at these grain boundaries, etc. It's very good at that, and as we've said, if you want to go and directly correlate the microstructure to the uh, interfacial excess using atom probe, you can do that uh, using uh, TM or uh, maybe uh, transmission mode EBSD as well as atom probe. Um, the evolution of precipitate formation and is a classic atom probe application so here's a nice nature paper from you know relatively recently which is looking at a high entropy alloy and basically comparing atom probe results showing the evolution of these precipitate phases with results from you know electron microscopy and small angular neutron scattering showing a really nice correlative study of the evolution of these phases I've shown this example for a lithium example material um, already. Um, so one of the things that these materials are basically compacted from primary powder, which is quite small. And a lot of what people want to do is to understand what's going on at the primary um, powder grain interfaces. And so, you know, using these methods make, of using um, specimen preparation using um, trans transmission mode EBSD, we're able to identify one of these phases and, you know, there are dopants and other elements added to these materials to highlight the, um, to, to improve them and we're able to see the aluminium binder material. For example, okay, so um, here's an example of, you know, imaging implant species like dopants, for example, 
you can you can use the atom probe to do that, particularly when you have complex shapes. Um, and clustering is an important uh, factor as well. Um, so clustering can be very important for uh, early stage hardening of structural materials, but it can also be important for things like dopants if we're looking at functional materials. So this is a gallium nitride quantum well structure where if you try and dope the PGAN with uh, too much uh, magnesium dopants, you form uh, clusters above a certain concentration threshold. And in the outer probe, what's really nice is we measure the position of all of these um, magnesium atoms, and we can measure um, to what extent they're clustered or randomly distributed in the bulk. And you know this allows us to know whether to what extent they're isolated and presumably electrically active. Whereas when they're clustered, they may not be contributing to doping. Um, okay, and trace elements. We count individual atoms, so that means our detection sensitivities are very high. We can achieve parts per million level sensitivity. Uh, of course, we have to be aware of counting statistics limits. If you measure, as I've said earlier, a cubic nanometer of material probably only contains 50 to 100 atoms. So, you know, if you're looking for a one parts per million in a cubic nanometer, you're not going to find it. So you have to measure many cubic nanometers to get uh, parts per million sensitivity, but we can do that in atoms. And so this is a really nice example of a geological material. In fact, this is a, a you know, a, a zircon from that's more than four billion years old. And uh, it's dated by looking at uh, radionuclide lead uh, atoms, which uh, from the decay chain from the original uranium present in these materials. And in atom probe, we were able to go in and basically investigate this piece of material, which is you know 95% the age of the Earth or something, and show that this lead is distributed in the uh, in the matrix here, and it's it's clustered. This clustering is associated with uh, damage that's been induced with, by the uh, alpha decay, and the clustering was enabled. Uh, these these materials are metamorphic, so they are formed and they under they 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 are subducted into hot regions and they have overgrowth. And so there's an overgrowth region here that's about happened a billion years after the original formation of this crystal. Crystal, and in this case. This clustering is absolutely present because during the elevated temperature experienced in this overgrowth phase, these lead atoms were, were able to be mobile and basically were able to move into these clusters. So this clustering happened you know, 3.4 billion years ago, but we can detect it in the atom probe, which is amazing. Okay. Um, a couple of other examples for zeolite catalysis. This is a material that relies on uh, aluminium distributed in the matrix to give its catalytic capabilities. If you age these materials and simulate end of life, you can use the atom probe and measure what's happened to the aluminium distribution. And it's changed dramatically from this random distribution of individual uh, aluminium atoms, which presumably helps with the catalysis, to highly clustered segregated aluminium, which uh, you know is much less. Uh, if, that we see in the materials that are at end of life that have lost their catalytic uh, power. Okay, um, so a last example: uh, defects, of course. Atom probe is good at measuring compositional changes, so structural defects, which you can see very nicely in the electron microscope, it's hard to see in the atom probe. But what we're really good at seeing, and the atom and the TM is less capable of doing, if you have some very subtle uh, compositional changes at these defects, we can see it very clearly in the atom probe. So in this case, you've got this. This is for an implant of silicon, which. Uh, the good thing with silicon, why it's great at making devices out of, is that you 
amorphize it during implantation, but when you heat it up, you can recrystallize it and you get back to epitaxy. But of course, you still get these residual uh, damage centers, and you know they're they're very tenacious. Even if you go to a thousand degrees rapid thermal allele, they still are present, lower number density. But you know the, you still have these dislocation loops and the strain field. But in atom probe, you can go in and measure directly what the local concentration of dopant species is around this um, around these features, and you could measure what the you know the how much the local the concentration of uh, dopant atoms has been you know decreased. Another example recently uh, looking at a thermoelectric material where the improved properties apparently come from dislocation network which are which are enriched you know with uh, other atoms and they 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 positively contribute to the phonon scattering in the material. Okay, um, I'm running out of time, but I just wanted to highlight that uh, the, the the Chennai facility or in IIT Chennai has been in place for seven years now, so it's a, a leap 5,000 instrument, um, and so it has it has all the advantages that I've that have that I've highlighted. You can do atom probe on it. What's exciting for us is that uh, we've recently introduced a new instrument which has some uh, new advantages. So new laser wavelength, larger field of view, and um, enhanced detection sensitivities can also be possible uh, as well. So this is also coming uh, to the atom probe world uh, and extending the range of applications that we can uh, achieve in atom probe. Okay, so I, I've I've almost run out of time. I hope that I haven't talked too long. There's still time for questions, but um, you know, brief summary is that uh, I hope I've shown you that atom probe is you know has unrivaled nano characterization capabilities. Um, introduce the the opportunities and the methods for specimen preparation and generated some interest in the utility of atom probe so thanks very much thank you sir uh, that was an informative talk uh, we have a certain questions lined up for you first question is by uh, miss richa is it okay to comment on morphology of precipitate from apt by creating isosurface or is there any other way we can uh, one can find out precipitate morphology by apt so i mean Atom probe, the reconstruction um, is fairly straightforward, but it, atom probe is not designed to, it, it measures local composition, local chemistry, and so it's not designed really to measure thicknesses or length scales. Uh, and so, um, so precipitate morphologies um, can be a little bit complex. That's why, I mean, if you know what your morphology of your precipitate is in the electron microscope or in your in your materials, it um, it's a useful piece of information to know um, because there are some types of precipitates that have different fields, and then you can get shape distortions if you don't accurately reconstruct. So it's useful to know. Uh, the morphology um, ahead of time sometimes, or it, it's good to calibrate your reconstruction if you want it to be accurate. Okay. Sir. But as I said, you know, we're not, um, we are measuring the internal composition. Uh, and so um, the, it's, it's an important consideration to, uh, if you want to get the, precipitate morphology in all cases, sometimes you, you need to calibrate your reconstruction to get the right shape. You know, classically, you know, many precipitates are spherical. If you don't use the right field, you'll get oblate or, you know, you'll get a slightly distorted precipitate shape, which looks a bit weird. But you you preserve the, um, well, you can pre you preserve the the uh, compositional information. Okay, okay, sir. But that's um, yeah. So it's a good question. Okay, sir. Uh, so uh, yeah. 
yeah sorry so related to this uh, how one can decide atomic percentage for uh, creating iso concentration map well there's no magic about it the point of an iso concentration map is really um so really what you're trying to do and i'm just trying to pull out an example so here really what we're doing here is we want to denote where the surface is okay between this germanium rich region which is red and the gray region which is silicon um and so you basically you know here for example the germanium is at around 30% here right and here it's zero so if you right if you draw a surface which is 29.9% you'll get a very noisy isha concentration surface because really you've got uh you've got regions in this material which will be will be below 20, will be either side of 29.9% so the simplistic answer is you just choose an intermediate concentration like here or here or here to render this icon iso concentration surface to pick out this interface so really it's a tool and you choose you choose the number to uh identify that specific interface you're not there's no right answer it's just you're using it as a way of uh delineating the presence of the interface okay sir so can we measure the despacing between uh, two uh, particles or atom by apt is it possible um every atom has a position in x y and z um so yes in principle you can measure okay. uh the distance between each atom or you know one atom type and another atom type or nearest neighbors um so for example the cluster detection algorithms use um that nearest spacing information to decide whether these magnesium atoms are in a cluster okay these are standard methods um and so i and in in some cases if you design your experiment correctly if you have crystalline materials i was going to try and um choose a slide which has um in in many cases you can get you can view atomic planes as well so um i wanted to show you this um uh, shall i stop the sharing i will start sharing again sorry i i managed to muck up my sharing i think but anyway so here's an example if in atom probe you have a obvious pole a low index pole you image down it for crystalline materials you can often see evidence planes in some materials so um this is uh something that you can do um in in atom probe experiments and it's useful many people calibrate their reconstructions by using lattice spacing uh of known poles in you know aluminium or steel alloys so yes in principle you can do this <clears throat> okay so it's not it's not always present but in the materials that show this uh characteristic information um it's possible to uh uh so we hello okay so i'm showing my screen right there sorry yeah so um so the answer is yes we can see atomic uh planes in some cases particularly in you know that's obviously crystalline materials and people have used this to study ordered alloys particularly super alloys you know over decades okay thank you sir okay. uh, we have another question most of the, the environmental or geological samples are uh, very fragile they consist of clay minerals layered silicates or nanoparticles of iron manganese oxide is it possible that nanoparticles or few units 
cell of layer silicate disaggregate uh, due to laser or uh, detected detected as a high molecule high if is uh, what is so, the max? yeah sorry atom probe is being used by geologists to do uh, to study a variety of materials but they're looking at um, zircons uh, and a variety of minerals to do dating. Uh, they're looking also for stable isotope uh, distributions, light isotopes, and also minerals and uh, you know ores, so um, basically precious metal ores. So um, atom probe is used for geology, but we have to be clear that um, you know atom probe requires you know structurally robust materials to do experiments on so if you have if you have a material that falls apart uh or is friable or is very super fragile um so into you know materials with very weak interfaces so graphite for example where you have uh you know a 2d material it, it you may struggle to get yield on those types of materials because it's just too uh, fragile but you know there are a number of applications in geological materials but the specifics of the one you mentioned i i'm not i don't think i can comment on it in an authoritative manner okay sir. So uh, thank you, sir, for answering our, all the questions. So on behalf of Safe Sierra and Society Bombay, I would like to thank Dr. Peter Clifton for such interesting talk on APT. I would like to thank our head, Professor Suparna Mukherjee and Safe Sierra and as well as Kameka team members for their continuous support in this webinar. Last but not the least, I thank all the participants for their uh, attending this webinar and making this event successful. Have a nice day. Thank you.